tonight on Need to Know, nothing but inspiring people. Some changing Rochester, others changing the world. They all share a common thread. Out of tragedy and hardship, one can find beauty and make a difference in the lives of others. Don't go anywhere. Need to Know starts right now. This year marks the 25th anniversary of the Rwandan genocide, a human tragedy that took the lives of an estimated 800,000 to 1 million people in 100 days. Daideen Umanyana barely lived to tell about it. She poignantly shares her story of surviving the conflict and the trauma of the aftermath in her memoir, Embracing Survival. As the title suggests, Umanyana found a way to seek strength and beauty in the most desolate of moments and to look at life through the lens of hope. Umanyana stopped by the WXXI studios during a recent visit to Rochester. She was the featured speaker at Monroe Community College's Human Rights Day celebration. Take a look. Dadeed, I tweeted about your memoir. I sent family members text messages telling them that they needed to read it because, as I mentioned to you before we started filming, I could not put it down. And you mention in your book that one's life experiences are not for them to keep or hold on to, but to share with others. And so I wanted to know, why is it important for one to share their story uh, with honesty and in a raw way, just like you did, as opposed to keeping it to themselves? <laughs> I, I, I feel like um, no matter where we come from, no matter what culture or religion, we're just human. And we have the, the same history. And if we're able to share what we went through, we realize that we're really somebody else somewhere is going through that. So you really help what you do when you're sharing your own story. You're helping them to know that tomorrow is going to be okay. If I went through this and I survived and, uh, and I'm okay, I can smell today, you're going to be okay too. So it's, it's more about educating people what happened and so they can see a relevance. Absolutely. Yeah. And creating this unique connection. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, I, I want, in the beginning of your memoir, you, you say these words, my country was once called the land of milk and honey, but overnight it has become a land of blood and sorrow. So for people unfamiliar, with the unimaginable horror that yeah. took place in 1994 uh, in Rwanda and why it happened. How do you explain to people what motivated the violence? What what led to this tension between the, the two social classes, the, the yeah. Tutsis and the Hutus? God, it's, it's a long history. <laughs> yeah, it didn't, I mean, for us, we genocide, we never went through it before 1994, so it was overnight. We felt like it was overnight, but it escalated from a long, like from a long history, and, and the, the, the tension and the hatred, the visionism really began way, uh, way back in, in colonial era, in 19, 1930s. That's when the, 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 the Germans came in Rwanda, it was the first um, that's when we were first colonialized. And you know what was happening in Europe in 1930s and 40s. It was the Holocaust going on. So uh, they, I always say that we cannot give what we don't have. It's, so what they had, that's what they give us. The, 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 they, they changed the social classes that we had into tribes. And, they you were, explain, and you explain this so well in the book that tribes <laughs> never existed prior no, to that. No, it was social classes. If you were a Tutsi, you, had, you owned more than 10 cows. Uh, and there was the elite class and middle class was the Hutus. So you could really come from the Hutu class and go to the Tutsi class if you had more than 10 cows. But after they, chain, they changed it into tribes, then you, you were stuck with whatever you were. If they measured your nose and your hands and whatever, they will classify you, they will categorize you in one particular um, tribe. So the, the, that's where the tension came from. And uh, what they were learning behind that was the, the story that the Tutus, they looked 
more European, so they might not be from Central East Africa. So they say they were from Ethiopia. And uh, teaching that, it made the Hutus feel like, wait a minute, these people are not from here, and they are the elite. Mm -hmm. they have, they're having everything in our own country. They should go back. So it really started just like that, the ownership, the entitlement, and, and then now it, in the 1950s, that's when we had the first civil war. They killed the king, and most of the Tutsis fled from Rwanda and to neighboring countries. So Congo. 300,000, is that oh, correct? Oh, yeah, 100, 100, almost probably 500,000 people fled um, to Congo, Burundi, Uganda, and Tanzania. And then a uh, few who stayed in the book, I explain it a little bit more, they lived in fear. Yeah. yeah, they were they were not they at school they were they were treated really horribly. It was yeah, it was just and some people actually changed their ID cards wow. so that they would not be if they looked a little bit more Hutu, they would change their ID cards. To, then they would become Hutus. So, and and then during the genocide they were caught because their neighbors knew. So it was right. it was this yeah. You were, you were almost four years old when the Rwandan genocide began, yes. and you were a member of, of the minority Tutsi community yes. uh, being slaughtered by Hutu extremists. And you share this memory of standing in a line, waiting to die, without totally understanding, at such a young age, that concept of death. But suddenly, your life was spared by an old Hutu man who came out and, and said uh, to the extremists, do not take her life because of your age, because you were so young. And I want to know what was the process like for you to travel back to such a time in an effort to, to learn, to remember, um, to recount, to move forward and share this story with the world? Uh, there was something, I have a very wonderful mom. She wasn't in, she wasn't in Rwanda during the genocide, and, and when she came back, she was with the RPF, and when she came back, my father had already um, traumatized because he lost his entire family. Um, I had nightmares, and I didn't know really what happened to me. I, d I couldn't put the pieces together of what happened to me, so she decided to take me back there. And that's how I was able to learn everything that happened to me, and it helped me uh, now dif uh, having a difference between a dream and a reality. Because I will wake up from those nightmares, and I will think my whole entire family is already is being killed. Um, and uh, that helped me to heal and. and and when I grew older, then I became me. Uh, I realized we need sharing the story, knowing what happened to you. It, 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 it helped. It helped me back then, and now even helps me now. Writing the book was was the most beautiful thing I've ever done, but it was was also the hardest I thing to it. do to go back and revisit everything and figuring out so many things I didn't even know that I still remember. And uh, it was it was. A long journey, but it was the very important healing, therapeutic. So even when I share my message to the world, I know it's also helping me. <laughs> yes, it was interesting because yeah. you talk about when your mom did take you back, she and did. and you saw the wife of that man who saved your life, and how she yeah. came outside just in shock to she didn't know to that see I you. Survived. Yeah, and and she didn't know that I survived, and and what she. What made her happy was that her husband didn't know that I survived. So, and and it, it always, I, I always feel um, uh, gratitude to, towards this man. You know, he, he. I don't know why he chose to save me uh, from everyone else who was there. But um, just his, his, his heart. Yeah. His children were, were perpetrators. Yeah. It's something that he was used to, but he mm -hmm. chose to. Um, to, so, to save my life, and if he wasn't there, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be here today. Yeah. You talk about the, the PTSD that your father uh, endured, and, and you talk about that very openly in the book. And as you just mentioned, just kind of going back and learning how to deal with this trauma. And it was interesting because you described, you know, even after, you know, after 100 days when an estimated 800,000, 1 million people had, were killed um, in this genocide and it ended, you said a silent war continued. And it was like this psychological war, um, yeah. an emotional war. Uh, and I I, and which was a taboo thing for you, really, to, to, to talk about at that yeah. at that time. How how have you learned? What do you want people to learn from your story um, about 
talking about trauma and being okay with talking about PSD, PTSD excuse me, and getting the help that people might need? Yeah, um, I mean, um, it's the understanding that when there's a surviving, it's not a choice to survive, but surviving after surviving, it's, a, it's your choice, but it's also a choice for the society, the community. So being allowed to share what happened to you. In my country, we, nobody really knew what it is to survive genocide, because yeah. we never going through it. So it was also, if you had PTSD, you were considered crazy. And that's something you also keep in your family, so nobody nobody knows about it. It's like a shame. Um, and uh, we suffered from it, because it was silent, it was inside, and, and you would just go through it alone, now knowing that your neighbor is actually going through the same thing. So um, PTSD, it's not, it's not a shame, it's an illness, and, and if you have someone to talk to, it, it helps to let everything out. So that, for me, writing the book was more about the, yes, the 100 days happened, but after the 100 days, it, it was a, a disaster. We had lost everything and, and, and everyone. So leaving a life after that, it was, uh, it was a, yeah, it was a new journey that we had to, to take. And a lot, of, a lot of us didn't survive it. There were so many people, like my dad, um, like just waking up in the morning and you don't have anyone there. It's, yeah, it, it, was, it was hard. And, and I've, even after years and years, that's people, because they were surviving throughout, after, ma after many years they were surviving. Um, now you graduate from college or high school and, and you don't have anyone to celebrate that with. So that's what really gets to people in the, um, then the trauma comes up after many, many years yes. because they have been surviving every single day that they hadn't had time to look back. Yeah. You raise points in your book that people really, um, from all backgrounds, um, all religions, all ethnicities, um, and life experiences can connect with in some way. And we stopped by Monroe Community College prior to your arrival, and we met with student leaders of MCC's Human Rights Genocide and Holocaust Project. Uh, and they were in the process of getting their peers to take human rights pledges um, and, and sharing a little bit more about you, your story. Oh, wow. And I want to go to a video clip because I want you to hear um, what they had to say just in terms of what they connected with when it comes to your story. Oh wow, yes. I She's a young person who has been through unspeakable tragedy and she takes that tragedy that she's been through and turns it into something good, turns it into positivity and love and raises women's voices with her organization. That's something that we can all support. She is very real about her struggles and that you empathize with her and you empathize with how she went through a hard time and she overcame it. That's really inspiring and it's really touching to everyone. She had a very rough family situation and I can relate to that and I love that she can talk about it, she can be very real about it and that she overcame it. When we're talking about genocide, whether it's the Holocaust, Rwanda, Bosnia, you could go on, they all have the same blueprints. They all start with concrete red flags that we can see, and if we step in and speak out in enough time, we can prevent that from happening in the future. And so that's what we want students to really connect to, is you have the power to do something, even if it's something little, like spreading love. One thing that I definitely want them to learn is how to stand up themselves because she stands up and she fights for human rights and she is very active in like promoting peace, just promoting goodwill for everyone. Did he emotional <laughs> for you to see that? Yeah. How does it feel? You you when you know that your story, I know what you set out to do, I think you're accomplishing those things and, <laughs> and you're getting you. people to to share their own stories as well um, and and to connect <laughs> with our world in a, in a really special way. God. <laughs> I I receive letters sometimes and I cry on my on my own in my yeah. in my apartment, but now it's <laughs> um it, it, this helps me not knowing that what I'm doing it's it's actually working and um, and um, it's not for nothing and if I can touch one life <laughs> uh, I, that life will touch 
of their lives. And that's the same guy who, the same man who saved me. Yeah. And, and now I can do this. I can reach as many people as possible. And I'm not perfect. I'm not, I'm still, <laughs> I'm still human and I do a lot of mistakes, but knowing that I can correct them, I can have, I can share my story and inspire someone somewhere to, uh, to do good and and when they see evil and when they see hatred they can stand up for that on they can stand up on that it's 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 an honor it's a privilege for, for me that and and thank you for for Absolutely. for for uh, yeah for doing this there's so much that we can all learn uh, from your story. And I know people are watching and they're thinking to themselves, how after, in the aftermath of such such tragedy, how is she able to cultivate this hopeful perspective on life and, and, and keep moving forward? Um, and I think that you're showing us how to do that. Well, I've been, I've been given a uh, second chance to leave, <laughs> so I'm not gonna waste it, <laughs> first of all. And, um, God, there's, I think there's a reason why I'm alive and I was always born and I, what I want to do good in, in life and I love seeing people happy. Um, and it's, it's um, I, yeah, I just want to see uh, the world better than, than I found it when I arrived here. And I would do anything I can in, in my small power and have that I don't have a lot of power but anything I can it, 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 it helps me wake up in the morning and be excited knowing that I'm not here for no reason yeah thank you so much for your time today thank you thank you for having me <laughs> Dean Umanyana launched Umbrella Press Inc. It's a platform for women around the world to share their stories and ensure their voices are heard. To learn more, go to dedean.com. Dante Worth could be called an empowerment doctor. From his books to his audacious Believer interview web series, the Rochester resident has crafted a business centered on helping others live their best lives. He does it all through sharing his own story of turning pain into purpose. Dante Worth joins me now to share more. Welcome. It is great to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. So you believe, Dante, life is meant to be enjoyed and not just endured. Exactly. And through writing, you openly share about challenges and issues that you've endured in your life. A diagnosis with alopecia, bullying, rejection, yeah. abuse, and so on. What was it that enabled you to turn your pain into purpose and really into a business to help other people live fulfilled lives? I knew that um, your story doesn't have to end with uh, a circumstance, that what you're going through is not the end. Every bad chapter is not the end of your story, that you can always change your life around. Um, my big trajectory change happened when I wanted a change in my life. I wanted something different. I wanted something different that was not so depressing, not so uh, demeaning to myself, not self-sabotaging myself so much. And I wanted to do something, so I decided to share my story. And I felt there was so much power in giving my story to someone else and seeing the, the release that happened for them by hearing my story, um, being liberated to share their own as well. Well, and your new book, Turning Your Wounds Into Wisdom. I love how you effortlessly, you'll tie in song lyrics at just the right time. <laughs> uh, really to convey you know, a message or to share an issue. Uh, and you quote American Idol winner Fantasia Barrino and her yeah. song Lose to Win when she sang, sometimes you have to lose to win again. Yes. So how did you find uh, self-worth and acceptance after dealing with varied forms of loss? And, and how do you use that to teach other people? It's all about having the desire and the will to rebuild after a storm, rebuilding after a trauma, re the desire is there. Once the desire is there, you're able to find the information that you need, to find the community that you need to rebuild and find the people that you need to become someone else that's not so depressed, not so self discouraged, not so discouraged and not wanting to give up. Um, for me, I knew that by writing my story and p packaging it into a, a book and giving it to someone else, it was liberating for me to see them um, get liberated and share their own story as well. Um, I didn't have anyone there to tell me to do it. They didn't say, Dante, you have to do this. There's no uh, professional there that said, Dante, you need to share the story. It was more an internal dialogue of changing my own um, internal dialogue and saying to myself, Dante, if you want better, you have to do better. That's, I, I believe I said that. It's a quote from, a chef, from, um, from Mrs. Oh my gosh, her name slips in my head right now. Okay. My Angela, my oh, Angela, okay. when you know better, do better. Got it. And when I learned to do better, I wrote a book about it. 
So for people, you know, this is uh, clearly writing for you was an incredible outlet. Yeah. Uh, and in terms of just expressing yourself, and as you said, just the, the process of healing that can take place when you are writing. Yeah. So for people, you know, who, who might think to themselves seeing this interview and they say, oh, I, it's such a vulnerable place to be in. It How is. do I even <clears throat> do that? Knowing that sharing their story, as you said, can help somebody else. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes people just think they don't have a story to tell. What would you say to them? I said that everyone has a story. I had to feel like there's something that you have been through, or whether it's been traumatic, whether it's been empowering, whether it's been something that has really encouraged you. There's something that you have to tell the, the world that only you can tell. Even if someone else has told that story before, everyone wants to hear it from you. The people that are out there who want to hear your story, who want to, who have, want to hear a story about overcoming rejection, overcoming um, depression, overcoming weight loss, whatever, the, whatever struggle you've overcome, people want to hear it from you and only you can tell it the way that you can tell it. Well, I mentioned uh, that you have this uh, web series, interview mm -hmm. series, uh, Audacious Believer TV Disclaimer. I was a proud guest on yes, your show, you <laughs> uh, which is how I found out about you and your empowerment work. Yes. Uh, I want to, what's the message behind it? You clearly have a strategy in terms of uh, the different people that you're choosing to interview, mm -hmm. uh, and it's very engaging. What type, what do you want viewers really to learn when they see this? My goal really is to, to send the message that you are not alone. Um, whether you're a leader or whether you're someone who just feels as though they, they don't have a position in the world, but a, a formal position, but you are somebody. Um, my goal is to show that as leaders, they're human, no matter what position you're in, whether you're a, a senator, whether you're a mayor, may, whether you're a re reporter, everyone has a story to share. And I believe as you share that story, there's someone out there saying, hey, me too, I went through that, or hey, me too, I want to get to where you are um, from where I am right now. So I believe the series is really helping people to really resonate with that, that no matter what position someone else is in right now, there's a story that led up to the, that place of getting to where they are right now. Well, we have to close for now, but we can, Dante Worth, first of all, thank you thank so much for being here. And to our viewers, you can learn more about Dante. You can also check out his books, Free to Be Me and Turning Wounds into Wisdom. Turning your wounds into wisdom. That's at DanteWorth.com. Rochester's Michelle Ashley wants to change the way we see and understand those dealing with mental illness, addiction, and homelessness. The photographer uses her camera to document social issues with the hope of bringing social acceptance to people she says are often ignored and judged by society. The self-described activist with the camera joins me now to share more. And Michelle, welcome. Thank you for being Thank here. Thank you. So you are a longtime hairstylist uh, and an owner of a hair salon in Brockport. and so. How does an entrepreneur in the beauty field decide to pick up a camera and shoot these raw, gritty images of individuals, oftentimes in less than beautiful conditions? How did it happen? So I guess it started, I was a single mom, my kids' whole lives, so I have two children. And once they grew up and moved out of the house, I sort of felt like I lost purpose. And I'm not the type of person to sit on the couch. I knew that I had to do something. I felt like there was more for me, and it just took off from there. I started volunteering at different shelters, just trying to find where my heart really ached when I went places. And it tended to be with the homeless, mentally ill, childhood poverty, that type of situation. There's a cool story that you've told me in the past about your father, how you didn't think you had this artistic <clears throat> gift. And then a, right. your father saw some of your photographs from years ago and said to you, you've got it. Right. Yeah, so my dad came to stay with me. I hadn't seen him in 20 years. And he stayed with me for 10 days. And he, I grew up knowing he was this incredible artist. And I was always jealous. And I couldn't understand. I looked like him, but I had zero talent like mm -hmm. my father. And when he stayed with me, he painted and sketched and was drawing the whole time. And you know, I'd said to him, I, I wish I had that talent. And he said, you're a hairdresser. You do. And I was like, but people wash their hair and it's gone. Like, you paint something and it's there forever. So the day he was leaving, he was walking around my house and I had pictures hanging up that I had taken in Haiti. And he said, who did these? And I was like, I did. And he was like, you do have it, yeah. you do. And I literally was like, wow. And he was like, now what are you gonna do about it? And that's where it started. That's how it all started. We 
feature artist Richmond Fitch Jr. Mm -hmm. and, and an exhibit that he did on, uh, and he told me he used your photographs for this exhibit called Out of the Shadows, and it was all about giving our homeless population a voice and to make sure that they were seen. And I want to know, when you get behind the lens, what are you looking for and what is it that enables you to get these shots that people connect with? There's something that you're able to capture in the eyes of a human being and people can just connect with them. And do you, do you even know how you do it? I mean, it's incredible. I don't. It's a good question because I really don't. Sometimes the people, I feel like people know who I am now and they actually ask me to take their photo, but I, I feel it. I don't see it. So I feel people and I really, um, I just will walk by someone and something will turn me around and, and we start a conversation. And But most of the time, to be quite honest, people know who I am now and they want their story to be told or they want their photo to be taken. They ask me to send their photo to family members. I've had people pull me aside literally and tell me their whole story and give me an address. Can you send this picture to my mom so that my mom knows I'm still here? And it really is, it's, it's really hard for me to pinpoint and explain because it just happens. It really just happens for me. You said people know you and ask you to take their photos. What did it take for you to build that trust? Because it's it's you're you're photographing some people in very vulnerable situations um, and situations where they may not want a photograph taken. But you've been able to make that connection. What what is it that you've been able to do that enables that? really enables you to get those images and show this part of our society um, that you have said sometimes people ignore? I think that um, because I'm willing to meet them exactly where they are today, um, generally I never start my conversation like we would, you and I would have on the street, like where do you work, what do you do? That's not something you're going to say to the people, my subjects, so I usually start it off like who are you? Tell me who you are. Tell me where you are today. Explain to me what's happening today. And so many times people are willing to bring it right back to the beginning so that I will understand what happened, how they ended up where they are. But they know that I'm not there to exploit them, that they, they also, I'm willing to share my story. You know, I have a background with this as well. So once they hear my story, they know that I'm not there for any other reason than to tell somebody's story. And what part of your story do they connect with? So I had a brother who was mentally ill. Um, he was a veteran. He was in the Air Force. And he, when he was about 20 years old, his schizophrenia started to really rear its ugly head. And he was discharged and was missing for about 27 years. And um, we found out he had passed away and, and nobody was notified. So I knew then I needed to put a face and a name to people that were on the streets. Well, the work you do is absolutely beautiful. And we're going to close for now, but I want to thank you, Michelle Ashley, for what you're doing thank in our you. community. And you can learn more about Michelle and her work. Just go to michelleashley.com. And that wraps up another edition of Need to Know. I'm your host, Helen B. and Judy Hofer. Thank you for joining me, and have a great night.